In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. This is the first Sunday of Babe, and today's gospel reading from the Gospel of St. Mark is about the healing of the paralytic man because of the faith and the effort of his friends. And the miracle is also included in the other two synoptic gospels of St. Matthew chapter 9 and St. Luke chapter 5. So it's included in all three of the synoptic gospels. Last Sunday we spoke about the love that God has when he created us, and at the same time, the love that he showed in restoring us once we fell in the story of the sinful but repentant woman that uh, we read about last week who washed the feet of Christ with her tears. This week, we see a further illustration of Christ's love and how he values those who come to him with a repentant heart and with faith. To recap the, uh, the story that we just read today, when we read, as we read from the Gospel of St. Mark, it begins with our Lord before the re reading of today, it begins with our Lord entering into Capernaum and teaching with great authority and healing the sick and healing um, all sorts of different diseases and he was casting out demons and the people were thronging around him. So he departs into a surrounding town and also preached over there, but the same thing happened. He was thronged with lots of people and so the people were following him. So then he comes back to Capernaum because of the crowds and chapter 2 begins with this powerful story that we read today. He enters into the house and everyone hears that he's there, so the same thing happens. The throng of people follow him and the house is overflowing. And he, as he was preaching, four friends of a paralyzed man tried to bring their friend to Christ, but couldn't because of the great crowd that was there. They couldn't get through the crowd. So they do something pretty drastic, something that we might not think of doing, which is they climbed up to a house, uh, the house where Christ was staying, they uncovered the roof, they tore out the tiles, uh, where our, and then until they saw where the Lord was, and then after they had broken through, they lowered the paralytic man through the roof. Our Lord, seeing the faith of the friends, not his faith, but the faith of his friends, doesn't heal him right away, but says to him that his sins are forgiven. Some of the legalistic scribes were offended about what he said, right? Christ did something that only God can do, which is forgive sins. And they reasoned in their hearts and they thought in their minds that this was blasphemy. How can somebody say that with authority that your sins are forgiven? Because after all, like St. Arrhenius says, how can sins be rightly remitted unless the very one against whom one has sinned grants the pardon? So only God can forgive sins because sins are against him. But our Lord perceived what they were thinking because he knows what's inside of a human being. He would perceive what they were thinking and what they reason in their heart and perceives to give weight to his statement of him forgiving sins by the healing of the paralytic man in front of everyone. And all were amazed and glorified God and said, as we read today, we never saw anything like this. Today's gospel is another beautiful example of how to find God and how he provides forgiveness to those who come to him, forgiveness and healing. But interestingly, today's story and today's reading of the healing of the paralytic man doesn't start with the physical healing, but with a more important type of healing, that of the soul. Our Lord doesn't start with the miracle which would, give, would, would have given him honor, right? If he would have just immediately healed the paralytic, everybody would have glorified God and he would have received lots of honor. But he starts with, uh, son, your sins are forgiven you. He doesn't say be healed. He says that your sins are forgiven. Christ starts with the healing that's more important for us, the healing of our souls through the forgiveness of our sins. He does something only God can do, even though he knew that would bring him ridicule. He does something only God can do. Man, your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> Not that he received permission from God, of course, that he said this, because he had the power to forgive because he's of the same essence of the Father. No prophet ever said this before or after Christ, that your sins are forgiven you with, with such authority. They would, have, they would have said, God forgives you. Even if God had revealed to him that, that his sins were, forgi were forgiven, the prophet would always say in humility, God forgives your sins. In this case, God says, Christ says, your sins are forgiven with authority. And this is why he came in the flesh. This is the only way that our souls, our bodies, and our full humanity would be restored, is that he comes in the flesh and heals us, restoring us to how we were before the fall of Adam and Eve in the paradise, and, and what happened after the fall with all of the consequential diseases and sins and, and calamities that befell humanity, 
as we still see even today, this is all because of that sin and God's restoration is needed. This is true healing. Those who were healed by Christ likely became sick later, right? This paralytic man who was healed by Christ eventually lost movement in his leg. Uh, because of old age or whatever, he eventually lost strength in his legs and as he got older, as is natural. But the healing of the soul, if we maintain it, it lasts forever. Spiritual healing is much more important to us, more beneficial, and it's much more readily available to us. Christ is present through the sacraments, for example, to provide us this restoration, this daily restoration and healing. Through communion, through confession, through the unction of the sick with its powerful prayers, and with also reading scriptures and with uh, following a life worthy of being a Christian. And for this reason, as a reminder, Christ, a reminder of his saving work, the priest says the unction of the sick, for example, or the litany of the sick and other prayers. He prays when somebody is sick. He prays for what? He prays for the healing of not just their bodies, but the healing of their souls and their spirits and their mind. The prayers for the sick are not just for the healing of the body. There's, there is also absolutions involved in the prayers of the sick and forgiveness of sins and freedom from the bondage of sin and from Satan. He gives us this grace to forgive sins to humanity through the priesthood, to forgive sins as mentioned in Matthew chapter 18 and John chapter 20. St. Ambrose has a really wonderful quote about this in the 4th century. He says, in, their, in, the, pre, in the ministry of the priest, the forgiveness of sins the priest does not exercise the right of some independent power, for not in their own name, but in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, do they forgive sins. They ask, the priest asks, the Godhead forgives. The service is enabled by humans, but the gift comes from the power on high. And he, Saint uh, Ambrose said that on his book, On the Holy Spirit. The priest also requests that the Holy Spirit forgives his sins too. So when, the, when we pray the unction of the sick, or the prayer for the sick, there's always forgiveness of sins, there's always prayers for release from the devil and his snares, there's always release and, and forgiveness and healing of the soul, which is much deeper, it lasts longer, because everyone who Christ healed, and we've seen so many people that Christ healed through the Gospels, or the apostles healed, or maybe some of the saints in the church have healed, like Pope Carolus would heal a lot of people. What happened to those people? They eventually got sick, they eventually lost movement in their legs. They eventually died as well, right? But the healing that they received in the soul, that's what lasts forever. Along with requesting the healing for the body, we also ask for release from all of the sins and, and all the unclean spirits and ask for mercy. We ask for rest and refreshment, grace, help, salvation, forgiveness of sins, and so on. These are the kind of healings that last forever. We ask for the sicknesses of our souls to be healed along with those of our bodies to be cured. The scribes in today's story, when they struggled in their minds about the powerful words that Christ spoke and with such authority about him forgiving sins, Christ showed them that he was indeed the only one who could forgive sins. The same God who knew their hearts and healed the paralytic man is also the same one who indeed forgave sins. And this was the good news. <clears throat> this is really the good news of today's story. Not that someone who was paralyzed was able to walk. That's great. And, and they glorified God because of that. But there was something much deeper. Because that person only later lost ability uh, to, to move, right? Through old age or through death. But that was now the forgiveness of sins. That is the true message of today's miracle. And the true... Um, reason for people rejoicing and glorifying God. The miracle only pointed to something greater and more wonderful, which is our salvation and our forgiveness of sins. This was the greater healing and the greater miracle and the greater cause for joy. So in this miracle, we see the power and the divinity of Christ and his desire to cure not only our physical ailments, but more importantly and first in the story, our spiritual ones, which last forever. This is the healing we should seek for every day. When we look at the story, sometimes the inanimate objects in this story or in other stories, they become um, like things that have like a, a deeper meaning and we can, they can point to deeper things. Um, we can picture, for example, the, in today's story, that house that Christ was in as a symbol of the church. 
the house they were staying in was like a type of church. And like all churches, it has a door, right? The easy way to get into the church is through the door. But the door of that house, as we read today, was blocked by those who wanted to hear Christ. Some with good intentions, and some, like the scribes, maybe not so good. But they hindered those who needed Christ the most from entering the easy way through the church, through the front doors. The roof of that house can represent the difficulty that we may have sometimes in seeing Christ. The difficult way to Christ in the church sometimes is even the, the people in the church. It's very interesting to me that the four friends found it easier to climb to the roof of the church, to remove portions of that roof so that they can lower it to their friends to go to the front door, then rather than go through the front door. I mean, like if I was there, wouldn't it have been easier to like, there were four friends, maybe two of them could have parted some of the people out of the way. Uh, it would have been easier just maybe to push through the people, explaining that they had a friend who really needed to be in the presence of God. It's not hard to imagine that they tried probably to do this at first, before doing something so drastic as to remove someone's roof. Those people blocking the entrance saw the paralyzed man, but didn't make room for him and his friends. Similar to the story of Zacchaeus that we read a couple weeks ago, where because he was so short and no one made room for him to enter and see Christ. We also see our Lord patiently and waitingly allowing the four friends to struggle. He must have seen this struggle from leaving their homes, from wrapping their friend around the stretcher to bring him and carry him. He saw all of that. He saw them trying to push through the friends. He saw them carrying his friend up the roof. And he saw them taking the tiles off the roof. He could have stopped them at any point in, the, in all of those challenges. He could have stopped them and said, make room for him. You know, make, like, have this one person wants to come through and you are, you're not allowing him to come through like he did with the children. Suffer the little children to come to me. But in this case, he let them struggle. He let them go through all of those like very difficult um, challenges. For them to carry him to the house, push through the people and find that it was useless and still not give up and go through the roof, balance their friend and lower him in front of our Lord at the risk of ridicule and offense to the owner. Can you imagine the owner seeing all this? This shows a lot of great faith and love that these four friends had. Christ saw their commendable faith in action, and as a result of their faith, he forgave the sins of the paralytic. He saw value in the struggle and rewarded their faith that worked through love in, in their friends. Like the discussion last week of the sinful woman, he allowed her to go through the struggle entering into the judgmental Pharisee's house. Here he does the same thing. He allows these four friends to struggle. And we see that throughout the, through other stories as well. For example, before raising Lazarus, he asked those around to struggle to remove the stone blocking the tomb of Jesus. Um, I'm sorry, the tomb of Lazarus. He could have, the one who rose Lazarus from the dead could have easily rolled the stone away as well. He asked Zacchaeus to struggle and climb a tree. A professional who's very rich asked him to do something so humble as to climb a tree. He asked the Samaritan woman to come and draw water from the well at noontime when the sun was hottest and not when it's easy. He allows Job to struggle with a one-on-one -on -one combat with Satan himself, even though he already knew Job's heart. Abraham, another example, who abandoned all of his house to go to a place he didn't know, and almost lost his wife in the process to the king of Egypt, and almost lost his own life as well, and was prepared to offer his son as a sacrifice. The whole time, God knew what was in his heart. And in today's story, the four friends struggled to encounter Christ. All of those who have become, all of these stories, and more also in the, in the Gospels and in our church history as well, they become examples for us and rising above our excuses that stop us or hinder us from coming regularly and consistently to encounter the Savior. They drew near to God and God drew near to Him because of their struggle. Sometimes the road to see our loving Lord is difficult. It's not always easy. And our Lord, though He loves us, allows us to go through these struggles. And I say sometimes because most of the time, He makes it very easy to be with Him.
in Bible studies, in the Bible that is at home, that just sitting there collecting dust. He makes it very easy. Or what about the liturgies that attend? Or what about the meetings we have at church and the spiritual meetings? Very easy. It's very easy to come and encounter him. But sometimes he makes it difficult. Why? Why does he do that? Why, does, why can't it be easy all the time? We can say there are a lot of excellent reasons for the difficulty, a lot of beneficial reasons. St. Clement of Alexandria says his purposes are wiser than men's and it is not possible for men to understand them. But to the extent that we can, we can learn from the fathers who have gone before us, the mothers who have gone before us, we can see that struggle is beneficial for us. His purposes for allowing us to struggle on occasion hold a great benefit for us that we may not see it during the trial itself. So let's discuss a few of these benefits. First, spiritual struggle, when we have to wake up to come to the liturgy, when we have to pray at home, when we have to come to a meeting, or is there a service in the church that is difficult? These are all spiritual struggles. Or is there someone hindering us in the church? Is there cultural reasons that hinder us? We have to fight through those. Because spiritual struggle increases our faith, it increases our patience, our maturity, and our spiritual growth. St. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. This is a sign of maturity. When there's a persecution or a challenge that the church faces, for example, when there is persecution or a challenge that the church faces, as it has for 2,000 years, who are the ones who will stand fast during these challenges? Who will be unshaken? Who will have solutions? Those who have gone through spiritual st struggles in the past and who have seen God victorious in their struggles. But those who have not struggled in their spiritual life are easily shaken and will look to those who are more mature in the church. And this is what faith is about, to endure when it's difficult, not when it's difficult to do so. If we face the struggles with courage, we'll find ourselves with a greater reserve of strength and virtue and faith than if we never face those struggles. This is something that we can talk about a lot, but for most of us, it's something that we will learn. It's a life lesson that we'll learn and we look back at. Another thing that struggles helps us with um, is to let go of something that we're holding on to tightly and that are weighing us down. Sometimes we are holding on to things of this material world that are not healthy for us. And God wants us to let go of them and he'll send us reminders, but then he'll send us a spiritual struggle. Is there something in our life that threatens our relationship with God that's difficult to let go of? Our Lord may allow a little struggle to happen in our life to help us to let go, even though the process of letting go is difficult, even though letting go has a little bit of a sting to it, even though that struggle may have left a scar in our life. God will heal the wound, but will leave the scar to remember. Give me people any day with scars. Because those are the people who have endured. Those are the people who have matured through the struggle than someone who's never endured any kind of spiritual struggle. But when we do let go of those things, what's waiting for us is far greater and is far, much more valuable and much more beautiful. Another reason for spiritual struggle is that we don't think, take things for granted. In our spiritual life, God is available to us very easily and very often. Most of the time, He makes it very easy for us. Not like the four friends that we encountered today. For them, it was a little bit difficult. But do we value those easy encounters? Do we value them? Are we thankful for those easy encounters? Or do we feel like entitled, like we deserve it or something, right? God makes it so easy for us. And... Um, he makes it so that he's very approachable. Do we remember the feeling of thankfulness, for example, when the churches were closed during COVID, right? And in other parts of the world, churches are closed through persecution. But when we came back, we were very thankful. We were very happy that we were able to celebrate liturgy and celebrate fellowship with one another. Are we thankful for those kind of things? So let's not take those things for granted. 
Yet another reason for the struggles is to help others who are struggling with something similar. Your struggle will help you relate to those who are struggling with something very similar in their life. Do you struggle, for example, with sicknesses, with marital problems, financial issues, career challenges, things of that sort? There are others who are going through the same thing and need your help and comfort and encouragement as well. Also, struggles themselves have their own reward. Struggles for the spiritual life is never, ever forgotten by God. This may not be um, something that we remember, but the struggle itself has a reward. I also like the quote that Pope Shenouda says, If you find yourself walking in the path of God with ease and constant rest, without tribulations or weariness, ask yourself, have I strayed from the path? If you're on the right path, the, the devil will not leave you alone. So why is he leaving you alone? We face an evil world, we face the devil, we face our own challenges coming from within us. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, as it says in Galatians chapter 5. A, spir a spiritual person always struggles with his body, the, always struggles with an evil world, always struggles with the devil himself directly. The struggle may be longer for others or shorter for others, depending on a lot of factors, but the struggle is witnessed by God and he will never forget it. Are we struggling resisting the evil world that we live in? Are we giving in and running with the crowd in the things that they're doing? When we resist all the challenges, striving to become more like the child of God that we are, which is the greatest of all human callings, there is no greater calling than that. And there is no greater fulfillment of, of your life than to be a child of God and to live as a child of God. Of course, if you aim for that, there will be struggle. And God knows this. And God allows it anyways, because he sees greater benefit for, a, from, for us in that struggle. This is what every Christian has to endure. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation will also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. So don't worry that God is going to overcome you with, with challenges and struggles, but only what you can bear as you, are, uh, as you can benefit from that. And the way of escape for the four friends today was through the roof, breaking through the roof. The result of overcoming struggle is much greater for our benefit than avoiding them. Sometimes we want to avoid spiritual struggle. We want to take the easy road, but then we miss out on a lot of benefit for us. In Philippians it says, For to you has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. At all levels, even if you struggle a little by giving him time every day, or providing a small service, or giving something that belongs to you to others who need it, these things build up more and more those whom you build you up more than those whom you serve. You benefit way more. Struggles reveal the inner invisible world of the heart. It searches out the hearts and minds and puts it to the test. We know what we're made of when we face a struggle. In church and everywhere in our life, we want to be like the four friends, breaking through the roof of excuses. The roof symbolizes our excuses and the challenges that we can face to find God's mercy, forgiveness, and healing. We don't want to be like the people blocking the entrance to God's mercy. There are many roofs in our lives that we have to break through, and maybe obstacles even caused by others. But with faith, we can rise above them all. We should have faith in the house of faith. This is the house of faith, right? We, this is the house of faith, and we have to have faith in that house, and outside the house as well, like the four friends. Having this kind of faith is a powerful, very powerful thing, powerful, powerful thing. It not only brings us to salvation, no matter what the obstacles or challenges or struggles, but it also positively impacts those around us. That's what faith does. In the case of our four friends, because of their faith, their friend was healed, both spiritually and physically. So may God grant us the faith of the friends, that kind of faith that works through love, which no one can take away, which lasts forever and which Christ will recognize in us and grant us the forgiveness of our sins, to whom be glory forever. Amen.